Dr. Ward Donovan. I'm Chief of Medical Toxicology at Pinnacle Health System in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And my practice uh, involves treating uh, individuals who've been poisoned, uh, but most of them are drug overdoses, uh, alcohol intoxication. Uh, and particularly I see a combination, I see uh, opiate uh, intoxication, opiate overdoses that come to us in two forms. Uh, one are younger people who are recreationally abusing opiates such as heroin, but also to a great extent prescription drugs, Percocet, Vicodin. And they're getting these from their parents, they're buying them on the street, they're stealing them from medicine cabinets, they're even stealing them from uh, pharmacies, they're uh, purchasing them, obtaining them wherever they can locate them, forging prescriptions, uh, and the other group of people that we see are those who have chronic pain disorders and really have become addicted to, due to the fault of their physicians who prescribe just ever-increasing amounts of uh, opiates and opiates are referred to often as narcotics, things like oxycodone and hydrocodone uh, for pain relief. And they get to the point where they're just constantly in a narcotized state. That means they're in an opiate overdose state. Uh, their mental status uh, is uh, altered. They're confused. Uh, their respiratory status uh, may be compromised. Uh, and ultimately, they end up uh, at our center uh, under our treatment to try to, first of all, resuscitate them, uh, improve and recover the organ damage that uh, has occurred, which often involves most of their organs. Uh, and uh, then we try to get them into counseling. The part that I do, the medical resuscitation part and recovery part, if they present to us alive, is actually the easy part. The hard part is dealing with the emotions uh, and the addiction and the psychiatric issues that have led to their addiction in the first place. And that includes both the younger set who are abusing opiates recreationally, as well as the wide range of ages of people who become addicted to uh, opiates, strong pain relievers, because of some initially usually relatively minor injury uh, that uh, is treated too heavily with opiates. And then they become an addict long after the pain of the injury has resolved and yet they still are seeking the uh, opiates because now they've become addicted to them. Um, and the growth of this epidemic, and it certainly is an epidemic, uh, at least in our experience, uh, and according to reports such as from the Center for Disease Control, really began uh, in uh, the uh, early to mid uh, uh, 2000s, in the 2005 range in particular, uh, and it has just uh, expanded uh, ever since. And uh, I and my group of medical toxicologists uh, devote our time to uh, treating these individuals, but unfortunately, as I said, uh, our treatment uh, is just the beginning, and the difficult part is to uh, get them into recovery and long-term recovery. And unfortunately, uh, I experienced uh, the addiction to opiates in my own family, in my son. Uh, my son had attention deficit disorder uh, with anxiety and depression, and that led to him seeking relief in the form of initially alcohol and marijuana and finally opiates and cocaine uh, and just about any drug he could find. And uh, we had him uh, in uh, counseling from the time he was in his mid-teens uh, until uh, he finally died of a drug overdose at age 28. And the uh, uh, addiction uh, led him into the court system, the legal system, unfortunately, because the legal system uh, does not treat these individuals. It punishes them, does not provide any meaningful rehabilitation and counseling when they're incarcerated. They're simply punished, let out. Uh, the stress of being in jail adds to their emotional disorders or psychiatric disorders and leads them back into addiction again. And it's a vicious cycle. 
my son's uh, problems with the legal system began just with uh, driving under the influence, uh, and that's his only crimes against society. And yet he spent uh, between uh, about age uh, 20 and age 28 a total of uh, over three years in and out of either prison or work release programs uh, simply because he had two different uh, DUIs because he continued to uh, fail drug tests because he, was, he would begin using drugs again after he got out of jail or work release. And so it was a constant vicious circle of in and out of jail, in and out of drug rehabilitation programs but never uh, an effective one. The epidemic of opiates, uh, I relate uh, personally to uh, a similar situation in the 1790s. Uh, we own a home uh, that was built in 1790. My family and my son grew up in that home, or at least starting when he was about eight years old, lived in that home. And in the 1790s, the gentleman who was a Revolutionary War soldier who built this uh, home lost his daughter to scarlet fever in about 1795. Scarlet fever uh, came out of Philadelphia and spread uh, west to the central Pennsylvania area. Uh, and that epidemic uh, killed uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of children. And now we have a similar epidemic. Uh, that uh, little girl uh, who was about age five and died of scarlet fever in my home uh, now uh, is uh, similar to the situation I faced where uh, my son died in that same home but from a new epidemic, the epidemic of opiate abuse. Back to the amount of people that you treat here that, that have what we call non-fatal overdoses. I don't know if you're aware that Pennsylvania hasn't cooperated with SAMHSA since 2009. So the statistics that occur in Pennsylvania never go to the federal government. Um, and I've been trying to find out. There must be, according to their statistics, there is a ratio of fatal overdoses to non-fatal overdoses. In this area of Dolphin County, have you ever looked at the amount of fatal overdoses versus non-fatal overdoses? No, I've, uh, I, that would require uh, uh, comparing my statistics with the coroner's statistics, and you'd have to not just look at the Dolphin County coroner, but the other surrounding county coroners as well. Uh, so I know how many people uh, we treat from opiate overdoses, uh, and it's uh, several a week who come in either acutely uh, overdosed or just suffering some of the more lingering effects of chronic addiction. Um, but uh, no, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how uh, the survival is. Uh, I would certainly say that we see the tip of the iceberg. That most of the people suffering from overdoses either are fortunate enough to survive uh, and never present to a hospital, an emergency room, any emergency room in the area. Uh, many of them, but I don't know the numbers, uh, die. Uh, and so we just see a few who are fortunate enough to be found or, or a family member usually bring them in. Uh, we're able to uh, resuscitate them, but not always successfully. Some of them uh, uh, succumb eventually, maybe within a few hours of present, presenting to us, or maybe a day or two later. Some of them uh, recover all of their organs except one, their brain. They suffer from what's called hypoxic brain injury, and uh, what's uh, often referred to as they become uh, in a vegetative state. And they end up in a long-term care facility and ultimately die of uh, infection or other complications of being in a prolonged coma. You're not seeing the hepatitis C and the other complications as a result of this, or what are you? Oh, it, m many of the people we see have, have hepatitis, uh, but if their sole problem uh, for presentation to the hospital is hepatitis, then they would go to a different group of physicians and not come to our toxicology service or would not be seen by the medical toxicologists. But yes, uh, certainly a significant number of our, of our patients uh, have uh, developed hepatitis from their uh, intravenous use of needles in particular.
So essentially, you're you're treating those that, that strictly come in here as a result of uh, most of them. I would assume are unconscious. Do they have more than a 24-hour stay, or what's the average stay for most? Uh, that widely varies. Uh, those who take a single overdose of heroin can actually be observed in the emergency department for a few hours, get a dose or two of Narcan, also known as naloxone. Uh, and actually go home if they've suffered some uh, or hopefully go to adequate counseling but that's up to the individual and all too often they choose not to seek counseling. Uh, some of them uh, have uh, enough organ injuries such as damage to their kidneys, damage to their lungs, sometimes damage to their heart that they need to be hospitalized and those that are hospitalized generally stay a, a two to three days Although those with more major organ injury may be uh, admitted to us for uh, anywhere from one to four weeks. Uh, and then they get to a point where either they're fully recovered or we transfer them to some sort of a long-term care facility. Do you see any, uh, you probably don't have enough time to get emotionally involved with these people's lives, or maybe you do, but do you see any common characteristics? Uh, absolutely. Uh, one very common characteristic that I'm sensitive to is the relationship between attention deficit disorder uh, in young people and the uh, abuse of drugs. Uh, I uh, can usually recognize almost immediately a, a young person uh, who uh, has abused drugs and recognize uh, that uh, they've had attention, attention deficit disorder that may or may not have ever been diagnosed. The parents may be aware of it and uh, the uh, young person may have been under treatment uh, for years, as my son was, or they may ne never really realize that the uh, instigating factor, the distressing factor that's led to drug abuse uh, in that uh, young person uh, is attention deficit disorder. What, in your opinion, is causing this epidemic rise in, in ADHD? Uh, I think it's always been there. It's a matter of uh, what uh, their drug of abuse is. I think it used to be alcohol. I know it used to be alcohol. Now with more ready availability of the opiates, uh, either prescription opiates or street heroin, uh, they're turning to those more powerful drugs. Uh, one of the factors that has led to this uh, opiate epidemic is the well-intentioned efforts of medicine to control pain and uh, pain became what's called the fifth vital sign. How much pain do you have because you shouldn't have any? And if you have any pain at all, well, let's throw some opiates at you, and then in increasing amounts. And so uh, either those people get addicted or they take those prescription opiates home, and those that prescription opiates then are available to their family, usually their children, sometimes to other relatives or uh, friends even who are in the home and steal these from the home from the medicine cabinet. Uh, the ready, the more uh, increasing availability of heroin and particularly the decrease in the cost of heroin uh, has uh, made uh, its use epidemic and those who initially start out using prescription drugs and perhaps again stealing them from their parents uh, from the medicine cabinet or procuring them on the street to find that they can no longer afford those because one tablet of Vicodin might cost anywhere from ten to forty dollars on the street whereas a bag of heroin might only cost three to five dollars uh, and the uh, more typically the those tablets those prescription tablets are going to sell for twenty or forty dollars per tablet and not have as long lasting effect as uh, one or two bags of heroin that they can purchase for a few dollars. If we were to take narcotics, prescription narcotics, out of the picture, which is, seems like an impossibility, do you feel that would have any impact about the underlying causes of what's causing this addiction to begin with? I don't think that the uh, underlying causes would go away, but the availability would go away, uh, or at least be reduced. It's never going to go away. Uh, if we weren't prescribing, and by we I mean the med medical profession, weren't prescribing so much opiates, then I think we certainly would see fewer victims of prescription opiate misuse. 
and there are uh, uh, actions being taken in this state and other ta states as well as federally to uh, reduce the availability of some of these prescription opiates. Uh, for example, uh, restrictions on the number of opiates uh, that you can prescribe out of an emergency room so that people can't jump from one emergency room to another, get a prescription at one place, go to another hospital, get a prescription at another place. They can only get a few tablets at each place and now, uh, soon, uh, there will be a program in place in Pennsylvania where uh, physicians will be able to access uh, a database that will allow them to know whether the individual they're treating in their office or their, the emergency room or in the hospital uh, is what's called a doctor shopper, or someone who's going to various places and obtaining an opiate prescription so that they will be a, uh, attuned to the fact and recognize the fact that uh, that individual is addicted to drugs and try to get them some counseling and certainly uh, try to wean them off the uh, opiates that they're using and and uh, treat the pain if they do indeed have true pain with uh, some other means and other medications and reduce doses of the opiates uh, along with uh, other non-medicine non -medicine therapies to reduce pain and adjunctive treatments, adjunctive medications that aren't as potent or as dangerous as the opiates uh, such as Neurontin and Pregabalin and similar drugs. Uh, but uh, reducing the availability uh, is not going to make the uh, uh, desire to abuse drugs go away. That's, gonna, that's a greater effort. And that's an effort that I'm not involved in. And as I've said before, that's a much higher hill to climb, huge mountain to climb as compared to what I do, which is just simply to recover that individual if they've survived the overdose. Uh, get their uh, organ functions back to normal and then try to uh, get them into a uh, rehabilitation program. But uh, you can't force someone to do that. Unlike the depressed person who uh, may try to commit suicide uh, in a single event, the opiate abuser is slowly killing themselves uh, but there's no, there's no uh, legal means to control that. Unlike there is a legal means to uh, control suicide attempts, that individual be, can be committed against their will to a psychiatric institution, uh, but the addict can't be. Uh, if they choose to continue to use drugs, uh, there's little that can be done. Uh, some other advances that uh, have occurred, and one that I think is, is very effective, and data has shown it to be effective, are the drug courts and uh, the drug courts came into place too late for my son uh, uh, tragically a drug court was established about a year after my son uh, uh, died and he would have been a perfect candidate for drug courts and drug courts uh, at least in statistics I've read have, have had a much uh, higher success rate than counseling and rehabil traditional rehabilitation programs and these drug courts are, are very strict. They require uh, almost daily uh, appearance before a judge or a magistrate or, or some uh, legal authority uh, to monitor their progress, uh, uh, test them for use of drugs. Uh, with a powerful uh, weapon uh, to be used if they fail the drug court, and that is then they go to a standard prison. Uh, so it keeps them out of prison which does nothing but punish them and offers no help whatsoever in their addiction uh, and uh, gets them into intensive rehabilitation programs. Uh, a, another program that has just uh, been developed in Pennsylvania, the law just recently passed, is the availability of naloxone or Narcan, which is the antidote for opiates. Uh, but that's uh, going to save a small number of people, I think. The larger number of people uh, need to be saved by uh, much more complicated and much more long-term and much more expensive. In the case of your son, more specifically, what age was it when you believe he might have started down that drug road? Treating the surface, which is give them a dose of naloxone and 
make them recover that time, but then a week later they take another overdose. And this time nobody's around with that naloxone or Narcan and, and they're found dead uh, eventually by someone. Well, uh, we believe he started in his early to mid-teens with alcohol and marijuana. It became quite obvious, certainly by his uh, high school years, that uh, he was abusing drugs and, and alcohol. Uh, but he probably started as early as age 12 or 13. We saw a change in his behavior in, uh, about that age, about uh, age uh, 13. And, and he had a very low self-esteem and depression and anxiety because his attention deficit disorder uh, prevented him from doing well in school, interacting well with his uh, friends in, in school and his classmates. And uh, he became uh, uh, so stressed and depressed about that that he found that he could self-medicate with medications. and attempts to treat his attention deficit disorder with traditional drugs such as Ritalin were not successful and he would refuse to take them and uh, found much more relief from street drugs and alcohol and marijuana than he did from any medication that uh, his uh, psychiatrist could prescribe for him. Do you think that ADHD, like autism, which is also being found at such great rates in your opinion, is that a genetic? disposition or is that something? Yeah, I, I think there's no question that ADHD is, is genetic and um, it's, not, uh, it's not something that you acquire from your environment. Uh, it, it's genetic and it does run in families uh, along and usually associated with depression and or anxiety. Um, so I'm focusing on the ADHD because that's what started my son down his mm -hmm. eventually fatal road. Uh, but there are many other factors that can uh, lead to that as well, uh, whether it's uh, uh, abuse as a child, molestation as a child, uh, uh, disrupted homes, um, lack of uh, family support. There are many factors that uh, lead uh, young people into the abuse of drugs. Uh, very often alcohol or marijuana are the gateway agents, uh, but then they lead to more powerful drugs later on. Can't ADHD also be triggered by trauma in childhood as well? I think there's some research uh, that shows that, but I'm not uh, an expert in AD8, in the uh, origins of ADHD. I'm uh, more uh, uh, experienced in both within my family, my son, as well as um, uh, seeing the individuals that I treat, and uh, many of them have ADHD, uh, and recognizing an ADHD young person. And ADHD doesn't really like addiction ever be cured. Uh, you have it for your whole life if you have it, but you, most people tend to learn to channel it, use it somewhat to their advantage. Uh, others, unfortunately, can't uh, control it. It's so severe that uh, they just turn to an abuse of drugs for the rest of their life, for as long as they might survive. What is the average survival rate that you've seen in the age group that comes in? Or is it well, I, I, don't, I don't know the, uh, the average uh, uh, years of, of drug use that eventually leads to death, but I can only tell you that the group uh, age group that we see is anywhere from uh, early teens to age uh, 45 to 50, uh, with most of them being in the age group of about uh, 18 to 30. Is there any difference between females versus males? Versus oh, we see a preponderance of males, uh, but uh, that's not to say that we don't see females. We see uh, a significant minority of our patients are females. And I should add that this is uh, this uh, addiction and this epidemic of opiates uh, crosses uh, all ethnic groups, crosses all age groups, even though it tends to be more of a younger person's problem. Uh, so no matter what their religion or their race uh, or where they live or how affluent or non-affluent their family is, uh, this epidemic 
crosses uh, all those boundaries. Uh, in uh, Harrisburg, uh, we are located, uh, Harrisburg Hospital is located in an urban area, but uh, the majority of the patients that I see actually come from the suburbs and the rural areas surrounding Harrisburg rather than downtown Harrisburg itself. Interesting. Um, once they get hooked, there's obviously a chemical change in the brain as well. It takes place, and from what I've seen, it's, it happens within several weeks. And some of these drugs cause brain damage within that same period of time. Is, can you elaborate on that whole process? Well, first, uh, some of the origins of drug addiction relate to uh, what are called neurotransmitters, chemicals that send messages to the brain, uh, such as uh, serotonin and dopamine. And so many people who become addicted already have a disruption of their serotonin mechanisms or dopamine mechanisms, and uh, that leads to anxiety, depression. Um, but also, as you use these drugs, those chemical transmitters systems are altered, uh, and they lead to uh, a uh, uh, progression of their addiction. As the serotonin mechanism, dopamine mechanisms are altered, uh, their uh, uh, addiction, their craving is uh, increasing. Is the medical, government law enforcement, and uh, rehab centers, are they doing what they should be or what they could be doing to treat this? Well, certainly law enforcement is not. Uh, and the legal system is not, except for, as I mentioned, the drug courts. Most of the legal system uh, is uh, oriented towards punishing the addict rather than treating them. Uh, here in Dauphin County, uh, we were fortunate enough, uh, my family, to uh, uh, in, be in contact with some judges who were uh, not in the punishment mode and focused on the rehabilitation mode and would send my son and I see them sending other people to rehabilitation programs rather than to jail uh, but some other judges uh, are, are not as uh, enlightened uh, but as I said before the drug courts is a, a big advancement. As far as the uh, rehab programs I, the problem with rehab programs to a great deal goes back to insurance or the lack thereof. Uh, and if you do have insurance to cover rehabilitation, it's usually limited. Uh, and so even though addiction is a disease, it's treated differently than diabetes, for example. There's no limit on how many days you might have to spend in the hospital or how many doctor visits you might have to have or how much medication you might have to have if you have diabetes. And, and that can be born on by obesity, which is another addiction. Right. Uh, so, and obesity leads to heart attacks and so and, and heart disease. And again, there's no limitation by insurance companies on uh, how much uh, treatment uh, and how frequently you can be hospitalized. Uh, those limitations are not placed on those diseases. But the disease of drug addiction is treated very differently. And even though there are now uh, laws uh, that are supposed to, re to remove these restrictions on how much treatment an addict can get, uh, the insurance companies seem to be ignoring them and continue to restrict the amount of uh, treatment that in a single year an addict can receive. What is the average that a person typically can go? Uh, well, the average stay in a rehab center is usually uh, uh, about uh, two weeks. The maximum is 28 days, uh, and that just uh, is the beginning. Now, if, it's, if that inpatient stay is followed by an intensive outpatient stay, the uh, success rate is higher. Uh, but the highest success comes with intensive programs, almost daily treatment for a year or two. Uh, that, uh, that kind of approach in dealing with not just uh, their uh, drug addiction, but the underlying factors in many cases that have led to that drug addiction. Most of the mainstream believes this is primarily an urban problem. 
Well, as I said, uh, um, my son lived in a uh, rural area. We're surrounded by farms. Um, most of the people that I treat, even though our hospital is located in an urban area, most of them come from the suburbs and from the rural areas. Some of the uh, worst centers for heroin availability and prescription drug misuse are some of the smaller rural towns in central Pennsylvania. Are you seeing a lot of crystal meth and crack as well? Oh, we see some, but not nearly as much as we do the opiates because of their availability. And uh, those who use uh, cocaine and use crystal meth, methamphetamines and, and hallucinogens, are less likely to end up in the hospital because they're less likely to cause uh, respiratory arrest, uh, that is, a loss of, of breathing, uh, which is ordinarily the ultimate uh, uh, cause of death in uh, the opiate overdose. Uh, so we're less likely to see them, uh, but we do see uh, uh, a growing number uh, periodically of certain uh, drugs that will come into the area and they might be in the area for a month or two and then they disappear. Uh, bath salts, for example, uh, and uh, some of the various newer forms of uh, methamphetamines, some of the synthetic methamphetamines, and they seem to come in groups, in bunches, and uh, be available for a while and then disappear. For a period of time, about uh, three years ago, we were seeing a serious bath salt case almost daily. Uh, and now we rarely see one because there are now uh, laws that heavily restrict the uh, availability of, of these drugs called bath salts. In the uh, case of ADHD, one of the things that I found is that a lot of kids out there are abusing that medicine, meaning that they will fake the symptoms and they will chew it to get that high and most particularly in females in college ages where they want to lose weight. The, the uh, drug such as uh, Adderall in particular, which is an amphetamine, uh, is uh, not a uh, rare uh, cause for presentation to a hospital and to our service. Uh, and as you said, it uh, is typically more in the high schools we don't see it quite as much in the uh, colleges where I think they graduate to um, even more potent drugs. Uh, but uh, the high school and college group do certainly abuse the prescription drugs that are used for ADHD uh, and they pass them around to their friends and sell them to their friends uh, and share them at parties. Uh, so that's another problem separate from the opiate addiction problem. And the latest trend I've heard from psychiatrists is they're now putting their, uh, besides chewing them, then they'll start snoring them, and then they shoot them up, or the latest fad is to put them in their eyes. They can use uh, the amphetamines just about by any route. Uh, uh, the more dangerous routes are either intravenous or actually snorting, either one. Uh, can, uh, is much more dangerous than just taking it as a pill. Uh, that's where we see the very severe cases where they've snorted them, uh, that is taking them up the nose uh, or injecting these drugs, melting them down and injecting them intravenously rather than uh, taking them orally. But most of the young people we see, particularly the high school kids, are, are just ingesting them. And uh, that's a group where we are less likely to have them present to the hospital. Uh, they may just uh, have some effects that aren't serious enough that uh, they end up being recognized as being seriously ill and, and they don't come to the hospital. It just seems to me that if we, we target the drug, um, we're not really, something else will replace it, guaranteed. That's not viewed as being that kind of down and out uh, inner city drug addict the same connotations aren't there uh, when you're able to use a drug by a means other than intravenous. Not to say that uh, kids in the suburbs don't use drugs intravenously, but most of them, most of them don't. They use them by other means, and they see that as more acceptable, uh, almost as acceptable as drinking alcohol. Your opinion on pot? 
Uh, I think uh, that it uh, that in those who have a tendency to addiction, it leads them to other drugs. But I believe that they've got to have a tendency towards addiction, a genetic tendency or an emotional tendency towards addiction, to move beyond uh, marijuana. The latest research I read shows that uh, a developing brain, like 13, 15, 16 years old, using pot on a regular basis creates the same type of brain damage as heroin. I, I saw that study. Uh, that's a fairly recent study that uh, chronic uh, marijuana use does have uh, damaging effects to the brain. Uh, that involves pretty heavy use uh, and uh, not the occasional use. And uh, I think the heavy use is the, occurs in the people who are more prone to have addictive personalities, which probably relate back to psychiatric issues or emotional issues that they suffer. I mean, some of them even compare puberty to insanity, uh, psychiatrists and so forth. And I think that anything that impairs that development, such as drugs, halts that development. I think that's pretty well established that uh, drug use uh, impairs uh, growth and development. Uh, particularly uh, social development, intellectual development, uh, advancement uh, into a, a more mature life. Uh, the drug addiction holds you back. Why do most of these kids seem like they're so lost today? So lost? Lost. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, the uh, pressures of society, pressures of school, increasing demands uh, and expectations by uh, society, by academia, by their parents. Um, but I think also it, uh, it relates to uh, the uh, cultural uh, pressures, the peer pressures that uh, they're confused about. You know, do I get into this crowd that's using drugs or do I try to stay away and, and uh, lead a, a more normal life and it becomes more difficult to lead that uh, old-fashioned normal life now in current society. There seems to be no individualism. It's like they have to be around each other on a constant basis, either via cell phone or, or whatever, and, and the technology there disrupts what I consider to be normal communications, uh, human communications. And in a essence, I, I compare texting to going back to Morse code. Uh, it's a different world than uh, than it was 20 years ago technologically. Uh, whether that has a relationship to leading people to drug abuse, I don't know. Uh, but one important uh, point to make is that uh, people uh, of all ages, uh, but particularly young people, who use drugs are going to be in a group of other young people who are using drugs. Uh, it's a it's a group practice, a group phenomenon. They are uh, rarely doing it by themselves. Um, and so one of the essential treatments of the young person who's addicted is to get them out of that environment, get them away from that social circle, uh, even get them out of that town uh, and into a, into a different area, but a controlled, some sort of a controlled environment. Because if a person uh, is going to be in a social circle of uh, drug abuse in one town, they move to another town, they're going to find that same circle. But at least tempor er, temporarily get them away from that social circle they're in and get them to a different area. It seems like it's a predominant culture, or is a majority you know, at that age group. So well, where, where do you run? Where do you as a medical toxicologist, I'm not an I'm not an expert in uh, in the psychiatry of, of some of these issues and just how predominant it is. I'm not an epidemiologist either, uh, but uh, I can only say that uh, it would be very unusual for me to see a young person who's the uh, victim of drug abuse that I treat and not see that either their family or their social circle or their both or both. Uh, are involved in the use of drugs as well. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? 
Um, I think what I mostly would uh, want to add is just that parents need to be on the lookout for changes of beha in behavior of their children. Uh, and at the first sign of uh, any problems, try to get them help and serious long-term help. Uh, and I've told uh, parents of young people who've had a near-death experience from a drug overdose that uh, they're going down a path of probable death uh, and that if they have to mortgage their home, take out a loan, whatever they have to do to get them into a long-term rehabilitation program. Looking back with your son, unfortunately, it's sad to hear these things. If there was anything you would do differently? Oh, that's something that I uh, dwell on almost daily. Um, I think if I were to do something uh, differently, I uh, would have uh, gotten my son into more long-term intensive programs uh, although he did he was in programs as long as six months but they weren't effective programs I didn't realize it at the time uh, there are uh, of course uh, uh, medical approaches such as the use of either methadone or suboxone uh, I think particularly uh, if I were to do it over again with my son I would have tried uh, suboxone uh, but the results are mixed with Suboxone and it has to be coupled with intensive counseling or they're just going to uh, stop taking the Suboxone and go back to the other drug. But those are the things I'd do differently. I'd, I'd look at uh, uh, medical treatment combined with extremely intensive uh, long-term counseling. There is a new drug out in the market that a lot of new addicts have run into. I think I believe it's Vivitol or whatever. Yes. It, it blocks the... Uh, the desire for opiates. Yeah, it's uh, similar to the idea behind uh, Suboxone. It's the Suboxone's generic name is buprenorphine. And uh, so any of those agents uh, might be tried. Uh, I think personally methadone just prolongs your addiction. And I'm not right. to start another addiction. And really just you become a methadone addict instead of a heroin addict. Uh, a lot of them I've seen become both. And uh, the um, and they sell the methadone so that they can buy heroin and uh, if uh, if they can get a hold of uh, methadone other than the very controlled methadone clinic programs. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm not a fan of uh, methadone as much as some of the drugs that uh, that control the desire and yet don't give you the high, such as uh, Suboxone. Some of the kids that are going into rehab that use Suboxone and so forth had some very negative reactions to it, like they couldn't sleep. Um, and it doesn't work for everybody. No, Suboxone uh, is something that I think should be tried, but it's not successful with everybody. The, the side effects are not great, though, unless they mix taking Suboxone with, with an opiate, and then they can have a, uh, an interaction between those two drugs that can make them quite ill. Uh, but uh, um, Suboxone itself is, for most people, is safe. The question is whether it's going to be effective for them. And, and as far as heroin is concerned, they can get in a rehab. They, uh, I have a girl I interviewed that found her addiction when she was in jail to heroin. Uh, drugs are available in, uh, in prisons. Uh, we don't want to kid ourselves about that. And uh, the environment of going to jail also just uh, fosters that culture of, of drug abuse. So sending these people to uh, jail is certainly not the answer, but it's uh, an approach that the legal system has used for decades and it doesn't work. If anything, it, it makes the problem worse for that individual. Do you get to see up here in the, the violent deaths and murders and, and, and attacks as well that, that are a result of drug fights and uh, her within the community? I can, uh, I can speak from my own uh, just observations in the Harrisburg area that we have uh, an extremely uh, uh, prevalent, uh, violent, uh, 
group uh, or groups and uh, violent culture that uh, leads to robbery, murder. Uh, the addict might be uh, stealing, might be robbing people to support their habit. Uh, they're uh, killing each other over the drugs and drug deals. Uh, Harrisburg itself has a very high uh, violent crime rate and very high uh, homicide rate, most of it related to uh, drug abuse. And unfortunately, there's a lot of kids, babies, being brought up in that environment. Uh, we certainly see uh, uh, in our uh, maternity department uh, infants that are addicted and have to be withdrawn. Uh, we uh, have a particularly difficult problem with uh, pregnant women uh, who are addicted and how to get them safely through their pregnancy uh, and control their addiction during the pregnancy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they often do deliver uh, drug-addicted uh, infants uh, uh, who also can have congenital abnormalities due to the drug abuse of the mother. I, I know in Mercy Hospital down in Baltimore, for example, on a typical given day, they can have an average out 60% of the babies being born as being addicted. I don't know what that percent I can is. tell you what our, our data is here at Harrisburg Hospital. I put a plug in. I, uh, I don't know if uh, anybody be interested, but um, uh, the, a foundation has been established in my son's name uh, through the Medical Toxicology Society. The American Academy of Medical Toxicology uh, has a foundation uh, uh, under my son's name, uh, the Ryan Donovan Fund, uh, and the American College of Medical Toxicology website is available by Google. I can't quote their address or phone number. Uh, but uh, if you're interested, uh, this uh, uh, fund is uh, intended uh, to uh, assist research through grants uh, about uh, addiction, uh, the factors that lead to addiction, uh, the best uh, treatment of addiction. Uh, so each year we give uh, one or two grants uh, out of this fund to uh, medical researchers. Um, so again, it's the American Academy, excuse me, American College of Medical Toxicology. Uh, you can uh, Google their website uh, and uh, find uh, their address, and uh, also you should be able to find on that website uh, uh, the Medical Toxicology Foundation. And you can contribute to that foundation, and specifically, if you're inclined to do so, designate your donation to the Ryan Donovan Fund for the treatment and research on drug addiction. Well, thank you. I appreciate the information. I appreciate you taking your time. I'm sure this is an amazing issue to talk about. No, no. I was laying in bed all awake last night thinking about, it's been seven and a half years, uh, thinking about I should have gotten my son in a Suboxone program. Uh, I'm in the process, I, I, I'm in the process of recertifying as a Suboxone prescriber. Uh, it just uh, brings up those memories that I never got my own son into a Suboxone program and I, I wish I'd at least given that a try. Cause some some addicts, there was a, uh, where did I see that? Uh, it was a, it was a, uh, a website uh, where I read uh, that uh, uh, Suboxone was being criticized as just another uh, crutch, another addiction, and many, many addicts uh, uh, tweeted back that uh, Suboxone saved their life. Uh, it seems to work for a lot of people, but not for everybody. There's a lot of bad information out there, a lot of myths. Myths such as, uh, you know, if I snort it, I won't get addicted that if you go into a rehab for two months, it's a lack of willpower, it's this, it's that. Oh, yeah, it's a... Uh, uh, it's, ignorance it's, is, is far more greater than the actual knowledge. I don't know if we're still rolling, but... Uh, I, I can shut this off. Uh, well, no, I was going to say on, on camera ahead, that um, 
that uh, there is that uh, misperception that uh, you're not an addict if you're not using the drug intravenously uh, and that it's socially acceptable. It's much like the idea that, well, I only drink beer, so I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, I only use uh, pills that were prescribed by my doctor, so I can't be an opiate addict. Uh, it's simply not true. Or I'm recovered, but I'm still smoking pot and drinking alcohol. Yes. Uh, so uh, there, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, rationalizing by the uh, addicts. Uh, there's a, uh, a lot of uh, non-recognition of the problem by family and friends because they're not out on the street shooting up heroin, so it's okay. I think probably one of the, the scariest things of all that still predominates is that, you know, they won't get treatment until they hit bottom. Well, to them, bottom is death. I mean, they, they will go through the most hellish, bizarre lives and still not find bottom. Most people who die, in my experience, from, uh, from an opiate overdose have already had one or two near-death experiences. Uh, preceding it. So they've really already hit bottom and they still, what you would call hitting bottom, you almost died, you had to go to the hospital, be resuscitated, uh, and uh, yet they go back after having that near-death experience uh, to using again. Uh, the addiction has such a stronghold on them.